Howdy. This is episode 38 of Free Speech Zone. I'm Bill Olson. We're going to start today with a real short little video clip. This is made by the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union. And what's happening is we're, well, we're about to see whether or not they can bring a successful lawsuit against two CIA contractors, uh, psychologists, who uh, single-handedly built the torture uh, regimen that we now uh, think is okay. Well, anyway, without any more editorializing, let's just watch this one. It's only just over a minute, and we'll be right back. We will smoke them out of their holes. We'll get them running, and we'll bring them to justice. You make you crazy. The use of coercive technique methods regularly resulted in fabricated information. Okay, that was a very well done production, but uh, basically it was the Cliff Notes version. For those of you old enough to know Cliff Notes, they don't even use that anymore, do they? Now you just cheat with your cell phone, right? Okay, well, anyway, uh, th this next video is the same subject, and it's a little bit more in depth. It's a little over four minutes, and this is a video from Al Jazeera News, and they're interviewing um, an ACLU uh, lawyer about this very issue. So let's, you'll get a lot more information this time. Is this about money or getting the CIA to take responsibility or both? Uh, this lawsuit is about the two psychologists who designed and implemented um, the CIA's torture program for and on behalf of the CIA. They devised the methods that were used to torture our clients um, and they implemented them. They designed a phased interrogation program and they tortured uh, three, uh, three, these three men, one of them to death. The problem is, as you know, suing people connected to the CIA is not easy. In the 50s, the agency actually drugged Dr. Frank Olson. It gave him LSD. He then was tossed from a window in New York City. 60 years later, six decades later, the family is still seeking justice. Most of the witnesses are dead and the documents are still classified. What makes you think that you'll succeed where others who have tried to do the same thing have failed? Mitchell and Jessen were independent contractors to the CIA, so they weren't, they, they worked with the CIA, they conspired with the CIA, CIA, but they were independent contractors. So you think the agency is just going to hang them out to dry? Uh, what, the, what the government has done in past lawsuits that, that, that we've been involved in um, is assert what's called the state secrets privilege. And they basically said that any litigation of this case torture cases um, is harmful to U.S. national security interests and they say that it will um, uh, reveal means and methods of intelligence gathering, um, it will harm U.S. relations with foreign powers. With the Senate report, uh, a 6,000 page, uh, page report, it sets out the basis of our claims, it sets out who designed Mitchell and Jessen, uh, the torture program, and that our clients were tortured, it actually names them. So. For the government in this case to step in and assert state secrets privilege, that would be absurd. But even when the agency admits that it has done something, nothing gets done. They said the same thing about uh, Patricia Lumumba in the Congo in 2007, 60 years after he was killed. The agency admitted it had done wrong. The same with Salvatore Allende in Chile. So even though there is a record indicating that what happened was wrong, what makes you believe that that record is enough? Because we, because we are suing these two individuals, they're named in the report. The report, the Senate report, is got extensive uh, 
details of uh, Mitchell and Jessen's involvement in designing the program, in implementing it, and in, in experimenting on uh, 119 individuals. Uh, that's, you know, it's unprecedented. That's a landmark report about the CIA and the CIA's involvement with Mitchell and Jessen. Now, Mitchell and Jessen both claim that their program saved thousands of lives. Dick Cheney has gone on record as saying the same. How do you counter that argument? And after Osama bin Laden was captured and killed, we're still asking the question which side was right and which side was wrong. So what we're saying here is uh, they're, they're claiming that their interrogation program was effective. If we look at the Senate report, um, the Senate report says that it was not. There was no actionable intelligence acquired through the use of these so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. But what this program was effective in doing was psychologically destroying um, our three clients and 119 individuals. That's, what, that's the only effective part about this. Program. The Senate Intelligence Committee saying it was not effective, the former vice president saying it was. Who wins that argument? Uh, the, the release of the report was bipartisan. Um, it's, you know, the Senate report is, is clear on this. Um, and we would, we would rest our case on that, that it, that it, that it was not effective. But Torture Mitchell is never effective. Mitchell telling ABC News the Senate report was entirely cherry picked and called it despicable. He insinuated that the panel was politically motivated. He's backed by six former CIA directors and deputy directors. How do you counter that? I, I, th I think we litigate this case in, in open court. Steve Watt, attorney from the ACLU, thanks for being with us this thanks. morning. Thanks very much. Yeah, that was a really good interview. Uh, Al Jazeera is a really good news source, and uh, of course, you're discouraged from listening to it because, oh, it has those funny little squiggles and stuff that we see on those terrorists. Oh, you know, Arabic writing? Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's not just brown skin that makes you a terrorist. You, if your writing is squiggly, you're a terrorist too. Now I, I know that sounds pretty stupid, but we have some really arbitrary rules. And uh, you know what really bothers me is how you know we're taught these certain rules and these certain principles and these certain qualities that America is supposed to have, and uh, behind the scenes they've all been usurped by you know evil. Per, you know, people with evil purposes, and it never seems to end the story uh, about, you know, one more thing that's gotten corrupted. Uh, well, anyway, I told you before about the Hassert scandal. Now, I mentioned that, you know, there's a, a giant blackmail ring that collects information on a scale that J. Edgar Hoover never dreamed of, and you know, depending on the politics of the situation or, you know, whatever, they can bring, you know, pressures to bear to make people leave, do things, vote, whatever, whatever it might be. And that's exactly what happened to Hassert. And so uh, James Corbett is one of the excellent researchers. He's from uh, Japan right now. Uh, he used to live in Canada, I believe, but he moved to Japan Oh, I think 2007. I might be wrong about that, but he's been there ever since, and he's started quite a, uh, oh, a journalistic endeavor. And this is the eye opener report with uh, James Corbett, and it's called the Hazard, the the truth behind the Hazard scandal, the real scandal, drug money. Yeah, we'll go on. <laughs> In May of this year, a federal grand jury indicted former Speaker of the House John Dennis Hastert. The charges, that he had structured withdrawals of over $950,000 from various bank accounts to skirt bank reporting laws, and that he had lied to federal agents about these withdrawals. According to the indictment, the withdrawals were part of a bid to pay $3.5 million in blackmail to cover up past misconduct from his time as a high school teacher in Illinois. The story seemed perfect fodder for the tabloid corporate press. It featured a former high-ranking politician, blackmail and intrigue, and just enough details about Hastert's former life as a teacher and wrestling coach to suggest that the past misconduct referred to a salacious scandal of sexual abuse of a minor. But for some reason, the story faded from the headlines almost as quickly as it appeared. 
And now that Hastert's legal team has announced that they are seeking a plea deal with prosecutors in order to avoid a trial, it seems the story is likely to disappear completely. But a series of revelations from FBI whistleblowers reveal that this story is just the tip of a very seedy iceberg, one that implicates Hastert, his top aide, other Congress members and government officials in a criminal network involved in sexual intrigue, foreign espionage, blackmail, and drug money. In 2002, Gilbert Graham, a special agent in the Washington field office of the FBI, blew the whistle on an illegal surveillance program being conducted out of the Bureau's Washington headquarters. According to the unclassified version of his complaint, obtained by the National Security Whistleblowers Coalition in 2007, Graham alleged violations of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in conducting electronic surveillance as a subterfuge to acquire evidence of criminal activity. These allegations were backed up by a former FBI counterintelligence specialist in the Washington field office, who told the National Security Whistleblowers Coalition, You are looking at covering up massive public corruption and espionage cases. To top that off, you have major violations of FISA by the FBI Washington field office and headquarters targeting these cases. Everyone involved has motive to cover up these reports and prevent investigation and public disclosure. According to FBI whistleblower Sibel Edmonds, revealing the details of this program for the first time in a series of podcasts in the wake of the Hastert revelations, this illegal surveillance program, dubbed COINTELPRO2 by the agents who were asked to implement it, dates back to the mid-1990s, when the Clinton White House was being rocked by a series of sex scandals. In mid-1990s, still bogged down with the Paula Jones scandal, a case that refused to quickly go away, while preparing for another sexual scandal, the Monica Lewinsky case, Bill Clinton and his top White House team put together a political retaliation plan meant to retaliate against and then neutralize the Republican Party and key elected Republican officials. The main objective of the plan was to, one, collect major dirt on key Republican officials. Two, use the information to blackmail those Republicans as a means to prevent impeachment. Three, strategically release the cases of those who did not back down by blackmail if the impeachment process were to proceed. The plan, implemented with the help of Clinton appointees Janet Reno and Louis Free, was remarkably effective. In December 1998, on the eve of the House debate on Clinton's impeachment hearings, Washington was rocked by House Speaker-elect Bob Livingston's sudden announcement of marital infidelity and resignation from the House. As the Chicago Tribune reported at the time, the speaker-elect said those investigating him were trying to find indiscretions which may be exploitable against me and my party on the eve of the upcoming historic vote on impeachment. Livingston did not give details of any affairs and said he was admitting them only because he had learned that unnamed individuals had been working with news organizations. At the time, Larry Flint claimed credit for forcing Livingston's resignation, saying that he had an audio tape of the congressman engaged in raunchy phone sex. This audio tape, according to Edmonds, came directly from the FBI's counterintelligence unit and the COINTELPRO2 program. Livingston's resignation was only the latest in a string of high-profile Republican sex scandals that involved information leaked to the media by unnamed sources in the wake of the Lewinsky scandal. Representatives Henry Hyde, Helen Chenoweth, and Dan Burden's adulterous relationships were all outed in the run-up to impeachment, with Burden admitting to fathering a child out of wedlock. Livingston was replaced as Speaker by Dennis Hastert, a congressman no stranger to scandal himself. In 2005, Vanity Fair drew on FBI insiders, FEC filings, sworn testimony, and other documents to report on some of the information the Bureau dug up on Hastert. This included FBI wiretaps capturing Turkish agents boasting of tens of thousands of dollars in payments they had used to assure Hastert's flip-flop on the U.S. Congress's Armenian Genocide Resolution. This is all nonsense. It's not being reported by the mainstream press because there's no factual evidence. The reporter does not have a transcript of any wiretap conversations that we know of. And even if we did, it's preposterous. The speaker does not have any connections to American Turkish interests. Shortly after leaving the House in 2007, Hastert registered as a foreign agent lobbying on the Hill for the Turkish government. But the dirt on Hastert and his associates went much deeper than this. 
information on hazardous, nefarious, and illegal sexual activities between 1996 and 2002 is far more explosive than the activities exposed in the recent so-called revelations. Hastert's sexual activities were videotaped and thoroughly recorded not only by two U.S. government agencies, but also by a foreign network, a criminal foreign network, headquartered in Chicago and involved in NATO CIA Gladio operations. Between 1996 and 2002, Dennis Hastert engaged in illegal fundraising activities in Illinois, these activities included receiving and laundering foreign-sourced cash funds, some of them drug money. Several other high-level elected officials were also involved in these illegal activities. Representative Dan Burton was a key figure, the mayor of Chicago, the governor of Illinois, and at least three high-level staff members were involved as well. Hastert's nefarious and illegal sexual activities have been broached in media reports going back at least a decade, since the time that Hastert, as Speaker of the House, helped cover up the Mark Foley scandal involving the sexual abuse of male House pages. Not only has Hastert's sexual relationship with his live-in Chief of Staff Scott Palmer been repeatedly hinted at in articles by the likes of former U.S. Senate staffer Lawrence O'Donnell, but as far back as 2006, investigative reporter Wayne Madsen was tying the Foley scandal and Hastert into Tom DeLay, Jack Abramoff, Southeast Asia, and child sex prostitution. State Department sources have also reported that the visits of Hastert and other congressional leaders and staff members to certain Southeast Asian nations and the Northern Marianas should come under the scrutiny of the House Ethics Committee, now officially investigating Pagegate. The Northern Marianas became infamous in the scandals involving Tom DeLay and Jack Abramoff because of the presence in the U.S. slave labor territory of Asian children being used as prostitutes. Conveniently, Foley co-chaired the House Caucus on Missing and Exploited Children, which would have had authority to investigate charges of child prostitution in the Northern Marianas, Madsen reported, adding, Hastert visited Vietnam, along with Palmer, in April of this year, and spent three days in the country. Hastert, along with Illinois GOP Representative Ray LaHood, canceled the visit to Thailand and Vietnam in January 2006. Hastert was also in Thailand in January 2002. This lines up with the information that FBI insiders have been trying to blow the whistle on for years. Since 1996, the FBI has had tons of information on Dennis Hastert, which was gathered in Chicago by the FBI's Chicago field office. The incriminating criminal evidence in those files range from bribery, extortion, fraud, money laundering, and embezzlement to sexual crimes against minors and participation in foreign-operated drug operations. Since 1997, the FBI has had much hard evidence on Dennis Hastert gathered by the FBI's Washington field office. The documented deeds range from espionage to foreign bribery. But that's not all. The FBI also has had hard data on hazard sexual violations outside the United States. The involved countries included Vietnam, Thailand, Turkey, and Morocco, among others. This also included sexual favors as means of foreign bribery. Interestingly, the CIA had been documenting those sexual activities outside the United States for many years, and not only on Hastert, but on many others, elected and appointed. So why has this information never surfaced before? And why is one tiny sliver of information that might provide a window into this story emerging now, nearly a decade since Hastert left office, and over a decade since the FBI wound up its surveillance operation. Realizing that the FBI's new dragnet was scooping up information on elected officials and political appointees across the board, not just presidential enemies, and with FBI agents increasingly outraged over the activities they were documenting, the White House, the DOJ, and the FBI sought a way to put a stop to the flow of embarrassing information. In 1999, the FBI COINTELPRO2 program was transferred from the FBI's counterintelligence unit to the criminal unit, ostensibly to pursue prosecutions. 
But as the program had been founded on FISA violations, FBI agents were informed that the information couldn't be used in a courtroom. It was this attempt to sweep these cases under the rug that infuriated many of the lower-level agents and caused Gilbert Graham to file his complaint in 2002. But by then, it was already too late. The FBI's surveillance was messy and involved too many agents who could potentially blow the whistle. In the wake of 9-11, the internal surveillance program was shifted from the Bureau to the NSA, and it was not long before those surveillance powers were being directed against politicians and officials in yet another attempt to gather dirt and find blackmail-worthy material on these individuals. As NSA whistleblower Russell Tice told the Corbett Report in 2013, he had first-hand knowledge of this surveillance, which included politicians, judges, military personnel, and even the future president of the United States. Yeah, it was, it was um, journalists, it, were, it was um, members of Congress, uh, both houses, Senate and, uh, and the House, um, especially on the intelligence committees, in the armed services committees, and on judiciary committees, um, and, and as well as the senior leadership in both the House and the Senate. It was judges, um, federal judges, and um, it, it, every member of the Supreme Court, all nine, of which I held the, the initial um, uh, targeting of Judge Alito in my hand when, they, when Judge Alito was being put up for um, you know his position on the Supreme Court, so I saw I saw the Alito paperwork in my hand uh, physically. Um, it was um, it was members of uh, of uh, a few members of, of Bush's own staff um, in in the White House. Now, who else did they? They went after uh, lots of lawyers and law firms. I noticed. In your um, interview on Boiling Frog's Post, you, you mentioned specifically uh, General Petraeus? Yes, they, they went after senior uh, military leaders. Um, with my satellite stuff, I saw, I saw how they went after, they went after um, the State Department. They went after Colin Powell, Secretary of State. They mm-hmm. went after General Saseki. Uh, and then on the terrestrial side, I saw the paperwork as they were going after um, General Petraeus. Was Barack Obama targeted by this? Uh, yes, he was. As a matter of fact, that was in 2004, probably now, late summer time frame. Um, and he was, he was a candidate for senator. He'd already won his primary in Illinois. And that's when I saw um, you know, Barack Obama's name. In short, this scandal is too deep, too dark and covers too many people from both sides of the political aisle for it to ever proceed in public. If it were to be exposed, it would uncover a tale of surveillance, scandal, drug money, child prostitution, and blackmail that could blow up all over Washington and make Watergate look like a minor footnote in the history of political scandal. Knowing this, it comes as little surprise that Hastert's legal team, already having been granted two extensions to continue negotiating a plea deal with prosecutors, pushed back the deadline for pretrial motions to October 15th, when a trial date is expected to be set. All specifics about the case are being kept under seal since, as the AP reports, Judge Thomas Durkin agreed to a request by the U.S. Attorney's Office to keep material secret, with prosecutors citing law enforcement and privacy interests. If these allegations of the FBI insiders of an illegal, White House-approved surveillance dragnet are true, and if the scandal does envelop several high-ranking politicians and appointed officials in both the Democrat and Republican parties, it is not difficult to imagine that Hastert's lawyers could graymail prosecutors, asking for evidence that the government could never turn over without opening up the whole scandal. And so we arrive at the present stalemate, where it looks increasingly likely that the case will be plea-bargained away and further inquiry will be stopped before the case can be blown wide open. Given the deafening silence on the accusations around this deeper scandal from the media, the evident refusal of the Department of Justice to look into the complaints of Graham and other FBI whistleblowers, and, of course, the reluctance of the government to even acknowledge the claims, the task falls to everyday motivated citizens to raise awareness of this story and create the space for more insiders to come forward with their knowledge of these cases. In the meantime, stay tuned to BoilingFrogsPost.com for continuing coverage of the case, its history, and further revelations. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information... 
Okay, and boy, I'll tell you, it's it, it's amazing. The uh, the the one thing that that court cases have that the bad guys are always afraid of is discovery. So you you want to prosecute me? Well, I'm going to use the discovery uh, capabilities to get all of those records that you want to keep hidden so badly. Well, let's uh, take a look at this next video. It's the update to this story and yep just like James Corbett predicted and anybody else would have reasonably thought they did make a deal so let's watch this and I'll be right back welcome ladies and gentlemen James Corbett here CorbettReport.com with your thought for the day October 16th 2015 and hopefully you will have seen my recent eye-opener report on the real Hastert scandal outlining outlining how the Former Speaker of the House John Dennis Hastert and other members of Congress and political appointees were embroiled, have been embroiled in drug money, money laundering, blackmail, and child rape, amongst other activities, exposing the real rot at the core of the political system itself. Not something incidental to that system, but something that's been ingrained in part of it, in into the heart of it, through this blackmail system of control. Well, you know, we have the latest update already uh, on that story, and this comes from, well, many places. Here's NBC News. Ex-House Speaker Dennis Hastert will plead guilty in Hush Money Case. Dennis Hastert, the longest-serving Republican Speaker of the House in history, one second in line to the presidency, has agreed to cut a deal with federal prosecutors, pleading guilty to charges he paid hush money to cover up allegations of sexual abuse. The deal will bring an end to the sordid case and keep secret the details of what really happened. Tonight we have React. Oh, that's right, a plea deal, which will keep all of the, uh, the allegations, all of the, the charges under wraps so that no one will ever find out what happened. Wow, that's shocking, said nobody ever. And of course... It should come as no surprise, especially to people who watched the report and all of the saw all of the information in there, including, of course, a uh, little nugget here about how all specifics about the case have been kept under seal and will continue to be now. Uh, as uh, Judge Thomas Durkin agreed to a request by the U.S. Attorney's Office to keep material secret with prosecutors citing law enforcement and privacy interests. So there you have a perfect collusion between the prosecutors, the defendant, and the judge all working together to keep all of the details of this case under wraps for the reasons that I outlined in this video report, but here's a little extra hint about the judge there and his relation to the case. Well, what's next for Haster depends on what happens with the judge today. Judge Thomas Durkin said he intends to disqualify himself because in the past he made contributions to Hastert's campaigns and he also worked with Hastert's son at a law firm, but he gave both sides an opportunity to request he stay on. Well, isn't that nice? So yes, uh, com c contributed to Hastert's campaigns, uh, worked with his son, conflict of interest start to finish, but he gave, you know, both the defendants and the prosecutors who both want the case kept under wraps a chance to, you know, allow him to disqualify himself, and they said no. So it all proceeded, and everything proceeded according to plan. The plea deal took place. We'll never know the details. Or at least, presumably, we will never know the details. But, uh, of course, some of them have been revealed over the years. And, again, there's lots of footnotes here for people who are interested in digging into this case. Uh, for people who do want more details, for example, about Sibel Edmund's story itself, I would, as always, uh, highly recommend Classified Woman, which is the, the non-fiction story of what happened to her, and The Lone Gladio, which is the story of what's really going on behind the scenes in fictional, fictional <coughs> form, of course. And for a limited time, the, the Kindle version of these books are greatly reduced. I think the uh, Kindle version of Classified Woman yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't realize that there was an advertisement there. He was just telling you how to get that book. But uh, you can figure that out yourself, and I strongly recommend that you uh, read A Classified Woman, especially. That's the story of her uh, whistleblowing about 9-11, and it's just hard to believe. She was, she was called the most classified, or I think that's it, the most classified woman in history, the most, most gagged. Well, anyway, um, now that we've uh, shown you some of this really good in-depth analysis by James Corbett, talking about skullduggery, pedophilia, drug money, blackmail, uh, and that's the behind-the-scenes mas uh, machinations, did I say that right, <laughs> of the political system? Well, 
Now we're going to switch for, for a change of pace to Alex Jones, who's going to, in just roughly five minutes, fill you in on, oh, probably 432 actually true parts of uh, conspiracy theories. So <laughs> check this out. I want to be clear, every segment, we're not being alarmist here. The federal government, with the Ford Foundation, the CIA, the mainstream media, I mean, it's in the news, the CIA is involved in social engineering, propaganda, psyops, and has hired more than 20,000 psychiatrists to help work with the news to pacify the American people. Obama signed an executive order three weeks ago on it. They legalized it last year, repealed the law. There's the Washington Post. How the American government's trying to control what you think. And you say, wow, you know, last year the Army, the Under Secretary of Defense, came out and admitted in an hour-long press conference that we've been lying to you, but we're going to stop now, and we're going to work with every local radio and TV station, every newspaper, and the Pentagon's going to be in your community helping and the CIA's going to be helping, and they actually had young, innocent information officers get up in their military uniforms, and they go, I'm sick of lying to people. The public doesn't like us. I'm going to get to tell the truth. And they go, thank you, ma'am, for your question. You can sit down now. And all these older men and women were just shaking their heads. She didn't get it, that that was a psyop, that they were, you have to hide it in plain view when you do something as brazen as putting the CIA on the streets. Watch the video. Government promises to stop lying because of Drudge Report Spotlight. But then you get into the article, that's not really what it is. And a Don Salazar, Alex Jones article. This is the occupational government. Does that mean the average person in the CIA is a bad person? No, most of them are compartmentalized. Most of them are analysts. It's not like James Bond. That's very small part of it. I mean, when the CIA wants people killed, the Army does it, at least until recently. And the analysts have been going public. First 50 of them, then 100 plus. Then the former general who just left a few months ago comes out and says, we've been ordered to lie to you with the intelligence. We were premeditatedly ordered to arm Al-Qaeda, which we knew would become ISIS. We're running it. Well, the president didn't know. No, no, no. We were ordered to do it. They consciously did it. Is that clear? Then the deputy director of the CIA goes on CNN and CBS on a weekend and says the same thing and says this needs to be investigated. So it's so immoral. These guys are scared when they're saying it. I see their body language. It's so immoral. It's so evil. These are like Germans, like Erwin Rommel in Nazi Germany, the Desert Fox, more highly decorated than even Hitler in World War I, big war hero, top general of World War II, undoubtedly. He was going to overthrow Hitler in Operation Valkyrie. He'd been strafed in his car, was already half paralyzed, but he was running, running the operation to kill Hitler. They came to his house, said, we're not going to kill your whole family, just drive down the road, take cyanide, write a note that you committed suicide. These guys are all one step away from that. One step away. You know, former top generals, former heads of special forces and others, have bodyguards they have to pay for all the time and hardly leave their houses now because they've been covertly killing them with heart attacks and stuff. I talk to them. Do you understand this, ladies and gentlemen? Do you understand this? I talk to the former head of special forces. I talk to the former head of army intelligence. I talk to the former... I've talked to multiple heads of formerly of special forces. They all know all this. You think this is a joke? You think this show's a game? You think any of this? No, no, this is real, people. And I've been praying a lot about this, and we can see it's all moving. It's worse than we thought. We kept hoping America was still here and that it wouldn't get so crazy. But I've just got to impress upon you that, that, that this country has been taken over. And you heard that former cop earlier, how concerned he was. Smart guy. The government is seized by people that are trying to take all the anger at the corrupt government and focus it on the police. Random cops every week are just being shot in the back. 
And a lot of dumbasses go, well, that'll show the cops quit being so arrogant. You know, they've been shooting. Yeah, there have been some crazy cops, some psychos, bad guys. They've been protected. It's wrong in many areas. But they're indicting most of them. They're getting in trouble. But that's not the issue. The globalists are running an operation to bully and terrorize the police into submitting to the takeover. So, you know you got a bold, crazy government in charge when they're planning a civil war. So we need the police and we need the military to keep speaking out. And they are. I mean, our military exposed that our government's running Al-Qaeda. Our military on this show, Colonel Schaefer and others, years ago. So the good news is the government's full of good people. Yeah, now you can say what you will about his hyperbole, but if you check out what he says, um, you'll find out that it actually holds water. Um, he actually has the reports he's talking about. He's a, he actually has talked to the people he says he's talked to. And, uh, of course, back in uh, June of 2001, just a few months before 9-11, he predicted 9-11, saying that if they crash airplanes into the towers and blame bin Laden, we'll know it's a lie. He said that three months before it happened. And it isn't because he's psychic. It's because he pays attention to what these uh, think tanks write. You know, they think that they're only writing for each other, but it gets published. And, you know, they're just counting on the fact that everybody's too busy watching you know, Dancing with the Stars and America's Got Talent. And uh, for the most part, they're right. Well, we've covered a lot of the Palestinian versus Israeli situation in the past, and it's, you know, boiling up again. The Israelis are back to their old tricks of, you know, massive, uh, brutal, violent oppression. And, uh, you know, they're, they're reacting to teenagers running around with knives you know okay but does that mean you have to kill 2,000 more Palestinians this is violence in the West Bank Palestinians living under two occupations and uh, violence springs up in the West Bank this is the Real News Network I'll be back in about 11 minutes welcome to the Real News Network I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore Violence is spreading in the West Bank and across Arab cities in Israel, reaching levels synonymous with previous uprisings from the 80s and the early 2000s, leading some to refer to incidents uh, as marking the beginning stages of a third intifada. Some of you may have seen the point-blank shooting of a demonstrating young Arab boy by Israeli plainclothes officers. These incidents were spurred following a September 13th raid on Temple Mount located in Jerusalem's Old City, a sacred site for Arabs worldwide. Leaders on both sides are attempting to curb any perception of a third intifada. Netanyahu is saying uh, on Saturday, in fact, that the attacks have been mostly unorganized and uh, the Palestinian Authority president Mahmoud Abbas calling the clashes potential for an intifada, which we don't want. Now joining me from Windermere, UK, to discuss all of this is Jeff Halper. He's with the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions. He is the author of many books. Among the most recent is War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification. Jeff, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me again. So Jeff, uh, give us a sense of uh, what's happening there. You just left uh, a few days ago, uh, but prior to your departure, what was actually happening on the ground that concerns you? Well, um, <clears throat> in, in, in some ways, it's, uh, it's kind of a lashing out on both sides. I mean, I don't like this both sides analogy because there's no symmetry of both sides. But I think, you know, a, it's simply the oppression and repression has gotten so great um, that um, 
that especially Palestinian kids, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about this. We're talking about five-year-old kids, six, seven, ten, and, and teenagers have simply been kind of lashing out. It began, it's true, with the Al-Aqsa Mosque and, and, and the closing of the mosque and threats on the mosque on the part of Israel, um, but it's spread all through the country. And I think it's a kind of, um, of desperation. I mean, one of the interesting things is, it, is that it isn't organized. It isn't political in that sense. It's kind of a, almost a self-defense, a resistance against, against the final stages of this permanent occupation, permanent apartheid, permanent imprisonment being imposed on the Palestinians. And I think what's significant is that it, it spread outside of the occupied territories. It spread inside Israel because uh, the condition of Palestinian citizens of Israel where 20% of the Israeli population isn't really much better than that of the people in the occupation. They're also uh, uh, subject to all kinds of restrictions and more and more being seen as a fifth column, as an enemy of, of Jewish Israel. Um, from the Israeli point of view, I think this is mopping up operations. Israel simply sees the conflict is over. It's saying to the Palestinians, there's no more political process, no negotiations, there'll never be a Palestinian state. You're going to be imprisoned, and you either submit, or you leave, or you die. And and I think uh, the repression, this repression on the, on the part of Israel, you know, where mandatory prison sentences, hundreds of kids being arrested, um, house demolitions increasing, and so on, really shows that Israel is in the final stages of repressing any kind of resistance, and of what it sees as pacifying the Palestinian population permanently. And uh, what do you make of Netanyahu saying on Saturday that the attacks have been mostly unorganized, trying to calm down the population? This seems out of character for him, who, who, who in the past has sort of seen these opportunities to escalate the violence against Palestinians. Well, I mean, he, he, I think he sees that opportunity. You know, his messages are mixed because what he's also been saying, I mean, he said it in the UN last week, is that this is incitement on the part of Abu Mazen, it's incitement on part of the Palestinian Authority, that it is organized. And, um, you know, he's been saying that until just a few days ago, the Shin Bet, you know, Israel's internal security services, said publicly, no, there is no incitement on the part of the Palestinian Authority. And he's had to change his line a little bit and say it's unorganized and so on. I mean, Netanyahu is a problem because he's trying to explain violence and resistance and really self-defense and despair and frustration all these things without dealing with the cause of it all which is of course occupation which is a word he would never utter and so all he's left with is somehow blaming the palestinians so you've got to blame them individually you blame them as unorganized groups you blame abu mazen you blame the northern islamic movement inside israel you blame, uh, 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 you know, Arab Knesset members inside. I mean, you find all kinds of people to blame, but he can't really come out with a good, coherent explanation of what's happening because he can't admit that the actual cause is repression and occupation. So, Jeff, uh, what are we to make of all of this now moving forward? Uh, some people are warning that a third intifada might be in the works. Um, do you think that is actually uh, happening? I don't think so. I, 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 it's hard for me to see that because, not because it shouldn't be a third intifada, um, and not because the, the anger and the rage and the frustration isn't there, but because Israel just has it too sewn up. You know, we have to understand that the IDF uh, is there as a com as as, as a per and the police as a permanent presence, not only in the occupied territories but again inside Israel. In addition, you've got the settlers, who are a kind of a militarized force, semi-legitimate in Israel, that have been uh, increasingly attacking the Palestinians and and uh, and uh, uh, you know they're part of the uh, part of the repression. And then in addition to that, we have to be honest: the Palestinian Authority itself in my view, is a collaborationist regime. The Palestinians are living under two occupations, and, that, and they'll tell you that openly. And the Palestinian Authority has been a repressive force 
It's militias working for Israel, arresting people, torturing people as well. And uh, they're a major source. I mean, ironically, I mean, I, Netanyahu blames Abu Mazen, Abbas, for incitement. But in fact, as a Shin Bet says, uh, they're actually very close collaborators. Nothing, nothing has interfered with the security cooperation, as it's called, between the Palestinian authorities and uh, authority and the IDF. So, you know, the Palestinians are really facing not only an Israeli repressive force that's trying to imprison them permanently and take their country, but a Palestinian authority that's collaborating, uh, you know, with that as well. So it's really a very desperate time, I think, for the Palestinians. Uh, now, how similar uh, are these events compared to, say, 2008-2010 events? I think they're different because those were political. They were much more organized. There was a sense that, that in a way, the Intifada is a push towards starting a political process or creating pressures, even internationally, that would force Israel into genuine negotiations, that in fact you could end the occupation. I think the difference is today that there are no Palestinians almost, I would, I would say, um, that think the occupation could be ended. I think they see it as, as, as a permanent situation. Um, many are leaving, actually, and there's really a sense of despair among the Palestinians. And that's why I think, you know, I'm seeing that this, uh, this uh, is more of a lashing out, uh, almost a self-defense, because the pressures put on the Palestinians, on the part not only of the army and the police, but again of the settlers, is, is such that they're really living in a pressure cooker. But it's not organized, it's not political in a way. Uh, and, um, and the fact that it's, it's mainly young people and kids uh, that, are, that are doing this kind of shows that in, in a sense. So the problem is that um, we've reached a, a, a place in which the Palestinians have nothing to lose on the one hand, but on the other hand they have nothing to gain. There's no political process that's possible today. Um, and I think personally we have to sit down critical Israelis and our Palestinian partners and begin to formulate our own solution to this conflict that I think is forget end the occupation, forget the two-state solution, certainly, which is over. Forget negotiations, forget the PA, which I hope will leave the scene soon. We have to start talking about one democratic binational state in Israel-Palestine and start to move towards that in order to really give a new sense of hope and possibility to both peoples. Jeff Halper, I appreciate those comments and that uh, idea, and I thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. I, it just, I, I lived in Israel for a year and a half, and it just blows my mind that they can be so viciously uh, racist and inhumane towards the Palestinians. I just, I, I, I can't understand how any people would treat any other people that way. I, I mean, it's just beyond my comprehension. It's outside of my life experience, and I don't want it to be understood by me, actually. But um, it's amazing. We, we've got to stop arming Israel. We've got to stop subsidizing them with cash. It, it's obvious that they're no better than we in the way they treat people. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're the number one exporter of terrorism in the entire world, and Israel is a close second. Uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Well, we've got a, a, a <laughs> another thing going. You know, how did, how did we ever find out about torture in the first place? Remember, it was the CIA whistleblower Jeff, Jeffrey Sterling? Well, they really threw the book at him. They convicted him of, what, nine different felonies, and, uh, or at least charged him with it. I'm not sure how, how it goes. Well, well, we better watch this video. And his wife, who's free, Holly Sterling, has written a letter to President Obama begging him to pardon Jeffrey Sterling. So let's go ahead and watch this, and I'll be back.
Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux outside the National Press Building where we sat down with Holly Sterling. She is the wife of CIA whistleblower Jeffrey Sterling who allegedly leaked classified information to New York Times reporter James Risen. But today, Holly Sterling is breaking her silence. Um, I came to D.C. today to discuss Jeffrey's case to um, really just let the public know of the tragedy that um, Jeffrey's endured um, for approximately over 10 years, that um, Jeffrey is innocent, he was wrongly convicted, and um, mainly because I wrote a letter to ask the president to immediately pardon Jeffrey. Great. And when you say he was wrongly convicted, can you go into that a little bit more? Yes. Um, Jeffrey formerly worked for the CIA, um, and he actually was the first African-American case officer to file a racial discrimination suit against the CIA approximately um, in 2000. And um, the case was actually dismissed in 2005 due to state secret privilege, saying that he could not go forward with this case because he would have to dis, uh, disclose classified information in order to prove his racial discrimination case. So um, actually, Jeffrey had a relationship with James Risen previously that um, he had main, made public knowledge of. And James Risen in the New Yes, and he was um, covering the discrimination case of Jeffrey. So. We've always, you know, divulged that there was a relationship there. And then um, Jeffrey was fired from the CIA, and uh, Mr. Ryden's book came out, and they pointed the finger at Jeffrey, stating that he was a former disgruntled CIA employee that wanted to get back at the CIA. He went through the proper channels, and now he's in, in prison. So, um, you know, I think it's it's difficult because even if you go through the proper channels, there's still going to be repercussions. The government um, wants to keep secrets; doesn't want the public to know really what's going on. Um, especially in my letter with President Obama, he said he was going to be the most transparent president ever, and and that's not happened. It's been shrouded in secrecy. Yes, we are. We are definitely appealing because, like I said, Jeffrey is innocent. Um, so the you know the lawyers um, are just reading background information, trying to get started to get briefs. Just that Jeffrey is not the disgruntled former CIA person that the prosecution uh, described him as. Actually, he feels really bad that he um, was fired from the CIA. He really truly believed in serving his country, doing what was right. Um, but unfortunately, with that, um, you know, he, he felt that people in our country were going to be endangered and he needed to step up and um, go forward with that. For The Real News Network, Jessica Devereaux, Washington. <clears throat> well, um, it's the same with whistleblowers all over. And, you know, did you know that there's a controversy about uh, Edward Snowden? Um, James Corbett, who I respect so highly, um, the, with the eye opener report that we saw earlier in the show <clears throat> today, uh, he calls it the Snowden snow job, and he thinks that Snowden is a controlled asset, a controlled uh, leak, leaking those documents on purpose as part of a plan by his bosses. Well, I don't know. I just don't know. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from my listeners out here, out there. What do you think? Can you, you know, I, I can't investigate everything. I, I can try, but I usually don't. <laughs> and uh, it would be real nice to, uh, you know, kind of share the burden. If you have a specialty of, of interest that you're, you know, quite researched on, why don't you come to the Free Speech Zone television show and uh, tell the world about it. <clears throat> I'm not much more than a glorified video jockey, but, uh, you know, we can change that. All we need is more people, more participation. Come on down to Portland Community Media and learn how to make films, learn how to make videos, learn how to uh, put the shows together, learn how to, uh, you know, plan a story, 
learn how to uh, plan all the shots that go with it, the A roll, the B roll, and so on like that. Learn how to use all the equipment. And guess what? After a minimal fee to uh, you know, be trained on some of the equipment, and it's relatively minimal training, you're pretty much on the, on the job trained. Uh, plenty of people around here to ask for help. But the point is, uh, come on down, don't be afraid, and you'll have thousands and thousands of dollars of, of free studio space. Every one of these shows is 5,000, I think three, three to 5,000 dollars, I'm not sure, per hour. So that's a pretty good gift, um, especially in this time when the media, the, the mainstream media, is not doing anything that we want it to do. It's not doing anything even close to a good job. Well, before we run out of time here, I wanted to show you. I got the documents that I had ordered up before 9-11. These were supposed to arrive before 9-11. This is the uh, Architects and Engineers uh, beautiful pamphlet. It's uh, you know, thick, glossy paper, well, well printed and well written, and uh, well thought out. Um, the uh, table of contents, I'll, I'll just go down the main points. The, the first chapter is formulating a hypothesis. Second, official investigations. Third is the destruction of towers one and two. The fourth one is the little known, uh, a lot of you guys will know it, but most people don't understand that there was a third tower that collapsed that day, World Trade Center Tower 7. Then chapter 5 is the uh, all about the high temperature uh, thermitic reactions, you know, temperatures you know, that lasted for months above 1400 degrees in the you know, debris pile, not to mention all the molten metal that has been witnessed. Uh, chapter 6, NIST's evidence for fire-induced failure. And it, it really covers everything very, very well. And guess what? Uh, I'll be giving these out to uh, certain individuals. Maybe we'll have a contest next week uh, or call in. Whoever calls in gets one or something like that. But these are excellent. They're, they're just exactly what you need to give to somebody who doesn't believe that 9-11 was an inside job. Because this is all about the evidence, the science, there's no speculation, and <clears throat> there's no gee whiz stuff that you have to take on faith. It's all verifiable science.